thanks for putting up the slides. So welcome and thank you for your interest in the panel Exploring the Borderlands, a Revolutionary Potential for the Age. So we took the subject of the conference that was, or the part, partial subject of revolutions very seriously. So we wanted to talk about revolutionary potentials for the age. And we thought that they could be found in the borderlands as it was once defined in the literature. So we inherit our structures from traditional humanities domains. We all know that, but many of these domains have inherent problems or inherited problems as well. So the goal of this panel is to address blind spots in the age, such as monolingualism, colonial heritage, and gender imbalance. And we realize that this is a very big field. And as you can see, not all of us are here. We try to make do with what we have and hope that this will be an interesting experience for you. It will um, get you thinking and get you discussing with us because we will open to the panel after the, uh, to the public audience once the panelists are done and yeah you're very welcome to share it with us uh, the perspective we're going to take is supposed to be international and multimodal and informed by cultural criticism and the reality of this panel as you can already see is that half of our panelists cannot attend in person due to various reasons which is telling um, once i present the panelists you will also know which of the panelists cannot attend, and they're mostly the ones addressing decolonializing the age, which is very sad and very telling at the same time. Uh, so Luise Borek is my co-organizer, is going to present the panelists. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here with us this morning after the uh, yeah, very great uh, conference opening last night. So we appreciate your, you being here despite being hangover maybe. And it's very impressive to be in this room because uh, talking about blind spots and we can't see, can't see anything because uh, <laughs> the lights are so strong. So um, please uh, excuse us if we don't really look at you and just look over you, it's uh, not intended. So we're thrilled that we're having um, great panelists who agreed, immediately agreed to uh, to talk with you today and to join us for this panel. And yeah, as Sarah said, it's um, telling that we have these challenges and we are super excited to have at least two in-person panelists and uh, some uh, videos that we are playing. And also like our panelists are gonna be uh, present uh, online. So we can't uh, put them online uh, to talk to you, but maybe we can transmit text messages. So should you have questions for them? Um, yeah, you can still address them. Anyway, so uh, it's my honor to introduce to you um, who is going to be on our panel. And uh, you see Quinn Dombrowski on here already. Quinn is academic technolo technology specialist in the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages and uh, in, in the library at Stanford University, as well as the co-coordinator of uh, Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, Sucho such as the dress is telling, as I just learned. So thank you. Then, um, sadly, uh, Domenico Fiamonte, who agreed to uh, prepare a speech for us, couldn't make it, so it's utterly uh, sad for us. Um, but we do have like a slide with uh, what was the plan originally. So probably you all, of, all of you know Domenico, who is a lecturer in the sociology of communication and culture, a department of Humanities University Roma Trey, and he's published on cultural uh, criticism of digital humanities and the geopolitics of digital knowledge. So uh, we're switching back to the in-room panel and Daniele Mitili, who is a research fellow in advanced data architectures for digital humanities at the Sloan Lab, um, up towards a national collection discovery project and who in 2021 completed their PhD in computer science at the University of Pisa. And Daniela is also the PI of the Wikidata Gender Diversity Project. So thanks for being here, Daniela. Then um, you're gonna have a, a video impulse by Padmini Ray Murray um, from the University of Edinburgh, who's the founder of Design Beku, a collective that emerged 
from a desire to explore how technology and design can be decolonial, local, and ethical. And Padmini established the first degree level digital humanities program in India at the uh, Sristi University Institute of Art, Design, and Technology, where she was course director from 2016 to 2018. So then we have uh, Dibya Roy, who is assistant professor in cultural studies, media studies, and digital humanities at the University of Leeds. He is the current vice president and founding member of India's first digital humanities collective, the Digital Humanities Alliance of Research and Teaching, uh, Teaching Innovations, so DARTI, it's the acronym, as well as a member of the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, Global Intersectional Inclusion Task Force. So, um, and last, not least, but uh, unfortunately also not present due to storms and thunder, thunder bolting is Melissa Terrace, who's stuck in Frankfurt and very sorry she can't be here yet, but she will be, uh, hopefully, during the day. So, and you know, Melissa is the professor of digital cultural heritage at the University of Edinburgh's design informatics in Edinburgh Col College of Art. Her research focuses on the digitization of cultural heritage, including um, its technologies, procedures, and impact, and how this interests with internet technologies. She's, the, she's a Turing Institute Fellow from 2018 to 23, uh, 2023, and serves on the board of directors of Transcribus, the machine learning infrastructure for handwritten text recognition. So you see we've got a, a very nice variety of uh, panelists online and present, luckily at least uh, two remaining. And um, we were thinking of um, first playing you the videos and saving questions for the end, so we are not running out of time, but there should be enough time to really discuss things after all the presentations. So I think we are ready for the first video, right? No, I don't know. No, no, no? The Domenico's slide is first. Okay. Yeah, so uh, just a very, very brief overview of um, Domenico's uh, presentation or what he was going to present. Uh, it was called Tackling the Issue of Epistemic Injustice in the DH, and he wanted to uh, address the important issue of epistemic and material asymmetries in the global south. Uh, obviously, the DH need to include underrepresented regions more. It's, it's obviously um, very brief and thus uh, might sound meaningless, um, but we would love to discuss these topics with you and maybe get competence from and expertise from the audience as well as we don't have uh, that competence represented here as much anymore. Um, but Domenico asks how the DH can contribute to the reparation of historical epistemicide. So essentially people making the standards are um, thereby killing other forms of knowledge. Yeah, and uh, also he was going to um, present projects contributing to the decolonization of digital knowledge. Yeah, and then we are ready for um, the first video, which is um, by Padmini Ray Murray. Hello, my name is Padmini, and I'm speaking from Bengaluru, India. And it's a great pleasure to be here, albeit virtually, and I'd like to extend my thanks to the other presenters for including me in this important conversation. In 2015, at the Digital Diversity Conference, I had observed, my DH is not your DH. And thereafter, I think I've been very invested in trying to understand what my DH might mean. I obviously mean this in the context of a country like India, where the very history of the humanities is shaped by its colonial past, imposed upon us by the British, who have introduced the discipline in order to educate and create a certain sort of subject who would work in the service of perpetuating empire. So the advent of my explorations were facilitated by the opportunity I had to set up the first degree level program in digital humanities in India. And it was extremely interesting to set up a DH program for design students rather than for the more conventional context of say literary studies or history. And this meant that we had to foreground different methods than the more traditional methods that are based on, say, close textual reading. I think something that emerged from my learnings of setting up the program was that all digital futures are designed futures, 
but we don't pay close enough attention in dh to the role design plays in creating those futures and to acknowledge its role in knowledge creation, production, and dissemination, as well as the significant role it plays in creating digital infrastructures that make DH work possible. Of course, we have had significant thinkers such as Johanna Drucker, Anne Burdick, Bethany Nowski, Tara McPherson, and others who have pointed to the centrality of design to the way we think in the digital humanities. Langdon Winner's seminal essay and approach has also been instructive in my thinking about how it is crucial to pay close attention to design in order to critique larger structures and systems, and is one of the foundational ideas that shaped the creation of Design Beku, a collective that I founded of researchers, designers, technologists, artists, and others, which works at the intersection of design justice and digital rights. We believe in working with communities and not for subverting the client-designer uh, relationship and envisioning and co-creating alternative digital imaginations with the communities we work with who might be marginalized by language, by caste, by class, by disability, etc. We believe in co-design, which is exemplary of care in practice, a combination of worldview and orientation. And we're inspired by Chuck and others' work on our design justice. We believe that this work is particularly crucial because Indian users are increasingly online but are still being marginalized by their lack of access, literacy, as well as awareness of how data regimes might work against them. We also try to subvert the kind of more established way of thinking about design, which has been overdetermined by Silicon Valley, which is this idea of delivering at scale. What we attempt to do is to create modular and flexible interventions that are appropriate and contextually relevant to the communities that we work with. And so we call this methodology infrastructuring as mean. So an example of the sort of work that Design Beku does is the Chanapatna Health Library. Uh, a project that uses the idea of the feminist server to empower a group of frontline health workers to create an archive for their community. To briefly uh, delineate what the feminist server idea entails, uh, it is the idea of a co-owned server that allows for a community to um, operate the server, to decide who has access to the data that lives on that server, to um, decide when it should be turned on, when it should be turned off. So it is rather than a very kind of masculinist sysadmin model, it is a community model of owning a server as well as the data that resides on that server. So setting up a feminist server can be considered an act of infrastructure solidarity and it's necessarily a community project which means that it's very appropriate for the sort of work that we do. We work in Chanapatna, which is a small town uh, outside Bangalore, and we work with around 14 uh, frontline healthcare workers. They're called health navigators. And these uh, women work with the community to advise them on their health needs, to advise them on lifestyle choices, while also measuring their blood pressure and their blood sugar, and being vigilant as to their health conditions. Uh, once they do this, they uh, record what they know about their patients as well as any sorts of local remedies that they may have suggested to um, aid the uh, curing of these disorders on, um, uh, on the server and they upload it to the server. And the server has um, uh, at its front end an annotation software. Uh, these are the, the 14 women that we work with. We've been working with them for around six years now. Uh, and so the annotation software that we use is called Popper. It's built by Janastu, which is another technology organization that works with grassroots communities. And it basically allows them to create uh, audio recordings where they uh, chronicle what they've learned um, from their patients or from their clients and allow them to annotate and tag the sort of uh, ailment that may have been um, suffered or uh, the kind of uh, mitigation tactics that they may have used in order to um, ensure better health for uh, the community member. So the hope is uh, that this uh, archive, which resides on the server, will be uh, made available to the rest of the community in Chanapatna, to which end we've set up a Wi-Fi mesh network, 
which act as a, acts as a sort of intranet and can be used by schools, universities, and others who live in the neighborhood. So just to wrap up, uh, I just want to say that um, when I had said my DH is not your DH, I had also said that there is a joy in that, in that difference and the kind of spirit of uh, innovation and um, subversion that it can foster. And we've been trying to um, maintain that spirit in our work as Design in Beku, uh, which we see as exemplary of how digital humanities thinking can be brought to bear on community projects and hopefully uh, lead us towards happier designed futures. Thank you. So the next video will be from uh, Dipiaruti Roy. The revolution will not be digitized. Hi, and uh, hello to everyone who's joined us, both online and offline, at the panel on Exploring the Borderlands, the Revolutionary Potential of DH at Graz. My name is Dr. Dibututi Roy, and I'm a lecturer in Cultural Studies, Media Studies, and Digital Humanities at the University of Leeds. And I'm also a founding member of the Indian Digital Humanities Collective 30, Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations. And I'm very, very delighted to be part of this panel. And I thank Sarah and Luise for inviting me to be a part of this panel and my distinguished panelists from all across the world. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this panel. Unfortunately, due to visa contingencies and uh, other considerations, I could not be present in person. But I believe that uh, hopefully the online presentation will lead to questions and conversations. So without further ado, my presentation today is titled The Revolution Will Not Be Digitized, Minority Cultural Viewpoints from Majority Worlds. To begin, the title of my, uh, the title of my talk today is taken from the spoken word poetry of Danny Mahes, who in a tribute to Gil Scott Heron said, The Revolution Will Not Be Digitized and basically talked about the lack of ideological moorings for digital realms. And using that as a departure point, I today want to structure my talk into three parts, which is structure, struggles, and strivings. So hopefully uh, this will lead to a lot of conversations and um, yeah, because we have limited time, let's get on with it. To begin, because the irony of not being able to be there um, at, a, at a panel on borderlands due to visa contingencies does not escape me, I want to introduce to you an artifact. An artifact which is an Indian passport. An Indian passport which has my parents' name, my place of birth, my sex, my ethnicity, and some myriad other details. And I also want to place with it another structure, which is a tent, the big tent of DH that we all know about, right? Which has made claims about having every disciplined methodological approach, institutional nature, and physical lo location within its within its large structure, right, uh, inclusive structure. Now what I want to, uh, what you want to kind of establish here by placing these two kind of structures together is that they are both ontological, ontological um, artifacts that bring a phenomenon into being. In the, on the left hand side, the passport brings into being the phenomenon of citizenship. This, that gives you an identity. It has its privileges and its disadvantages. For example, I know an Indian passport does not allow me to go into EU territory, unlike maybe a UK or a US passport, but it does give me certain rights and gives me an identity of a nation. Similarly, being part of the big tent or even uh, you know, being, uh, being, uh, being aware of the big tent, whether you're inside it or not, gives you certain understandings of DH. And this is very important, why? Because in the world that we inhabit, the exercise of modern knowledge and power pivots on fixed terms. So passports, big tents, these are all ontological terms that allow us to provide fixity and create power structures. However, uh, in both of these power structures, there are some outliers. For example, for people who are undocumented, who don't have a passport, who are often called illegal, right? This legality is predicated on the idea that you need to have a passport to become a citizen. Similarly, the idea of a big tent predicates that you are inside the big tent or even if you're outside it, right, there is an understanding of what the big tent does. But what about people who don't even know what a big tent is? 
what about them who are not aware of that structure of that ontology right so this is where i want to begin today's talk about borderland dh to talk about both dh borderland or borderland dh or in in other words i want to talk about those practices and locations that are beyond the peripheries of normative dh right and to think about them to understand and appreciate their revolutionary potential it is important to operationalize the beyond so what refuses easy categorization and what what i say, when i say easy categorization what do i mean i'll give you a case study for example we know that uh, you know computing in the humanities as jeffrey rockwell talks about uh, precedes the digital humanities and has intersections across all of these all of these uh, various disciplines over the last uh, 50 50 odd years and a little more than that even early 20th century but to think about digital humanities in its specific context is very important to understand the the infrastructures of digital digital digitality in fact i'll give you the case study of india where the first computing infrastructures arose as part of the nuclear infrastructure for example homi bhaba who's the father of the indian nuclear program is also known as the father of the computer revolution in india which meant that the first computers in india came to support nuclear logistics and scenarios and were shrouded in the same secrecy that nuclear establishment was shrouded in in fact the rise of the first community infrastructures of computing was in the late 1990s when cyber cafes arose in india where which became community hubs and in these places for the first time people could access uh, you know come in digital infrastructures what that tells us is that the location of digital infrastructure is as important as what it does with it right so in this particular case i want to invoke the idea of majority world which is basically a term that shahidul alam uses to talk about the part of the world where the majority lives and to understand digitality in a majority world and in fact digital humanities in a majority world this is an argument that i often make with my colleagues and co-writers that to understand dh in the majority world is to understand it as a rhizome and the rhizome as a metaphor amplifies the lack of an academic institutional or structural focal point for dh which like any point of a rhizome can be connected to anything and must be very different from the tree or the root so no primary root no secondary root it's a rhizomatic structure it arises anywhere and makes those connections that may not be immediately visible as in normative context to make that rhizome metaphor even more explicit i'll take you to a specific uh, issue in india in the early 2020 just before the covid crisis there were a set of laws enacted in india called the citizenship amendment act which made divisive rules for muslim citizens um, based on certain parameters of nationality religion birth and this led to large scale protests of course the limited time of this uh, presentation does not allow me to uh, you know kind of make you understand what the what the granularities of the situation are so i would uh, you know exhort you to go and search citizenship amendment act protest so this ca protest all over india led to a number of offline protests but at the same time there was a lot of misinformation being circulated on dominant social media and immediately after the ca protests we had the covid crisis happening in march 2020 onwards and later on towards the covid crisis we had the oxygen uh, oxygen kind of crisis in india during both these phases uh, the organization that i am a part of hurti we have a whatsapp channel and i moderate that channel and that channel became a site for a lot of lot of conversations that were not happening often in mainstream mainstream digital platforms and because it was moderated we were able to both uh, see the resistive resistive ideologies as well as something that could help people so during the ca protests we had people coming in trying to often peddle misinformation which was then countered and this became an, a good site of dialogue about the necessities of this of the situation and the need to understand and listen to people and on the second uh, second kind of example during the covid crisis many of our colleagues including uh, you know many of my colleagues in dharti they started uh, you know dedicated helplines to help find places to get oxygen for patients and covid uh, you know and and, and uh, their relatives so this this became this this site this uh, social media platform became a, a nepantla a borderland area a space of construction 
without preconceived and techno positivist goals while not decrying the, the the value of whatsapp as a place that's used for information capitalism and part of the e empire this also became a place for resisting those dominant ideologies so to you know move on further what does this tell us about you know the kind of work that we do as part of community based dh because that's the that's the argument that we are making for borderland dh that borderland dh needs to be community based dh and over the last few years we've been very fortunate that dharti which was earlier known as dhai has been able to do quite a bit of work in creating spaces for digital humanities conversations in india including the first digital humanities conference the first digital humanities twitter conference as well as you know social outreach events like dharti speaks the i think the key idea that's behind this kind of community based dh is that we are not algorithmically generated communities but it's a sense of belonging driven by open reciprocity that implies a relationship of permanent mutual commitment and this is something that makes us was particularly uh, you know kind of visible during the last 30 2022 conference which happened in the third wave of the covid crisis in india and it was entirely uh, you know done and organized uh, online right so it was the organization was online and many of the organizers had never even met each other and i don't think have still met in person in possible cases but it was a very very successful enterprise and what this made us feel was this new media based ad hoc collectives become floating virtual communities epitomizing a form of dh com- commons and this kind of dh commons really allows you to garner and kind of hold together the revolutionary potential of digital humanities in non normative spaces and this kind of inclusion is um, also a form of methodological inclusion but also socio cultural inclusion because it talks about a variety of dh practices worldwide and in this sense the community becomes an ethical orientation outside oneself and towards others and i would love you to and we'll be putting these um, uh, keynote speeches online soon and i would especially ask you to look at the keynote speakers uh, paula dikwarte ujano aisha to budabe and peter tirumal and um, this essentially helps us understand like what is the character of the kind of dh that we hope to bring out in this borderland so um, elika ortega talks about all dh being local dh rupika risam says that dh can only be inclusive and in its diversity can only thrive in an environment in which local specificity is positioned as center this is absolutely absolutely important but what does this local dh mean now local dh is not localized dh because localized dh is something that is within a small area and does not spread and our aim is not to create localized dh but local dh and what does local dh look like local dh emerges from a sense of community which connects us and the values that we hold in common this is from lisa spiro's famous essay right you know the values in digital humanities and it's it comes from an affective fellowship not driven by ethnocentricity that galvanizes dh as an infrastructure of relationships and sensibilities this is from the keynote speech that paula bikar tuishano gave at the 30 2022 conference and what i want to kind of bring and conclude with because we have limited time is that instead of trying to pigeon hole digital humanities we should focus on a community that comes together around values such as openness and collaboration and often political events or what is understood to be political events or you know crisis can create such you know elements of community which we should hold together and not try to always use a disciplinary boundary to hold them together and this is why i also want to amplify a number of other collectives in india that are doing fantastic work which they, while they may not explicitly identify as digital humanities they perform the work at the borderlands of the age which is what i hopefully we should be able to talk about so the three collectives are the mili archives collective which is doing fabulous work the digital games research association of india which is the digra digra india and janastu which is a, a civic tech organization that does fabulous work in digital spaces and analog spaces in india so with that i hope uh, that creates uh, a lot of conversations in the online space and thank you so much uh, thank you so much for listening in and uh, have a good day now we will move on to the in person panelists um with a presentation by daniele mitili 
on the Sloan Lab. Thank you. Um, so I'm Nadine Metili, and my presentation is titled uh, Beyond Data Borders, the Sloan Lab Experience. Uh, this, present, this presentation, I will start by talking about uh, the Sloan Lab project uh, I'm working on. Uh, and then I will move to a more general uh, discussion of data uh, in digital humanities uh, and this concept of data borders. Um, so the Sloan Lab, uh, looking back to the Build Future Share Collections, is a three-year discovery project uh, funded through the Towards the National Collection Program in the UK, which aims to build uh, a national collection uh, connecting um, catalogs from uh, uh, all cultural institutions in the UK, such as museums, libraries, and archives. Uh, in our project uh, is a case study on a specific collection aiming to reconstruct and reinterpret this fragmented collection uh, through digital means. Uh, this collection that we're working on uh, was created by Hans Sloan in the 17th and 18th century and his collaborators. And it is a collection of everything. Uh, it contains uh, 70,000 plus objects, such as books, uh, plant and animal specimens, uh, historical artifacts, uh, artworks, um, fossils, uh, coins, uh, and a bit of everything. Um, after Sloan's death, uh, the collection was fragmented across different institu institutions, uh, uh, including the British Museum, the Natural History Museum, uh, uh, the British Library, uh, and other uh, smaller institutions. Um, so what we are doing in the project is aggregating, uh, integrating, uh, and uh, enriching uh, uh, the data through semantic enrichment. We are building uh, a, a knowledge base uh, that then will be published and we, will be open for the public to access and query. Uh, we have uh, several data sources, including historical catalogs, uh, contemporary records, uh, uh, external sources, such as uh, I put here Wikidata, uh, and some uh, data that is annotated in the project itself. Uh, but today I'm not talking much about the details of the project. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can come to the panel that is specifically about uh, the Sloan Lab on Friday at 11 a.m. Instead, uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, um, the framework of linked data uh, that we're using, uh, the traditional way of looking at data sets, uh, and in, in some ways, uh, uh, our project uh, is uh, a classic uh, example of uh, a case study where linked data solves uh, some problems. Uh, so in the linked data framework, data sets are often uh, viewed as silos uh, that are disconnected and they need to be reconnected together. Um, following the FAIR principles, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse. Um, this is a good framework. It works in practice, but uh, um, let's try to take a different perspective uh, and see perhaps uh, the data sets as islands. Uh, and there are borders between the islands that cannot be freely crossed. Uh, so in some way we can see this kind of work towards uh, aggregation and integration of the different data sets as building bridges. This is quite simplistic, but uh, perhaps it works. Uh, however, there are many kinds of data borders, uh, and in this case I'm intending borders that prevent uh, uh, the data from being aggregated. There are technical borders, which is what I'm focusing the most uh, in the project. Uh, different formats, different data models, different infrastructures, and I could, uh, and I mean technical infrastructures, and I could say a lot about this, but uh, I don't have time today. There are institutional borders, uh, starting from finding agreements between different institutions, uh, uh, 
And uh, there are different cataloging practices, for example, in museums, that, uh, uh, where sometimes it is difficult to uh, bring the records together for this reason. There are copyright and legal borders, uh, such as the different copyright regimes uh, and licenses adopted by different institutions. There are national borders, uh, uh, there are cultural borders, there are many kinds of uh, obstacles when trying to do a project like this. However, this is also somewhat uh, incomplete because, uh, yes, uh, so I put this picture again, but uh, perhaps uh, these data sets are not sitting neatly on the ground of the islands, but they are uh, uh, on some tall mountains. Uh, if, we, if we view um, the problem this way, what do I mean by these mountains? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, we're building some bridges between the data sets, but these are somewhat uh, bridges in the sky because these data sets and this knowledge that is contained in the data sets cannot be freely accessed by everyone uh, even if it, if it is made available as linked data or indeed as linked open data. Uh, and the reason for that is that there are these other borders that are maybe orthogonal to the previous ones, but uh, in this image, but uh, they are very, very important borders. Um, so, and some of these, I mean, uh, uh, are related to access access to technology, access to the internet. Uh, there are many people that are excluded from uh, the results of our project. Um, and then there are uh, borders uh, related to access to knowledge, because to understand uh, the data sets, uh, the data models, uh, the contents of the data sets, uh, you need access to knowledge, a lot of knowledge, to get uh, to the point uh, uh, where uh, the data sets can be understood. Also because these data sets are described from the point of view <coughs> of the institutions uh, which hold the knowledge. So in some way they act as gatekeepers. And I, <coughs> and I also want to mention that uh, uh, we need to also look at the data that is outside of the institutions. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge and probably more knowledge outside of the institutions than inside. So if we just try to uh, look at it in the classic uh, way, which is connecting uh, uh, the data sets uh, with each other without uh, considering these other uh, issues, uh, I think we're making a mistake. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the data that is outside is less difficult to access, it's less structured, uh, it's maybe it doesn't follow standard data models, maybe some knowledge is just uh, in the minds of people, uh, but this is not an excuse to not do the work to bring down these borders. Uh, what is the solution, in my opinion? Uh, there are technical approaches that, are, that can only solve uh, some partial, uh, solve the issues partially, let's say. What we are doing in the project, uh, first, uh, very important is the support for multivocality, this concept that uh, uh, is not widely adopted, uh, uh, where uh, we can support uh, different uh, perspectives on the uh, contents of the data sets and different descriptions about the same objects. And we don't say that one is necessarily better than the others or uh, more accurate. We say that uh, uh, all of these perspectives exist uh, and we try to contextualize them. Then there is a the question of uh, data biases and absences that are found in every data set because data is never neutral. Uh, and uh, so this is also a focus of our attention 
uh, in the technical team and beyond. There is also usability and accessibility uh, and finding out what are the user requirements for the final outputs of the project. But then I also want to talk about uh, uh, what the other team in the project uh, uh, is doing, which is uh, the participatory uh, approach, uh, which is not about connecting institutions uh, uh, alone, but about connecting communities as well. Um, so the participatory uh, package of the project is organizing uh, co-creation uh, and co-design activities. Uh, we have 10 community fellowships also. We, uh, so we have people that are coming into the project from outside and bringing different perspectives uh, and spending three months each working on their project, which can be scientific or artistic or more technical. Uh, and then, of course, I want to mention uh, the importance of the care principles and having an anti-colonial approach because we, uh, we need to remember that this is a collection that was uh, assembled uh, during a time of colonialism. Uh, I want to conclude by, by saying, uh, uh, by addressing uh, the elephant in the room, which is uh, I don't think that uh, even if we do all this that I mentioned, uh, we are going to solve the problem. The problem is structural, uh, is structural inequality in academia and beyond, also in the world of uh, cultural institutions. Uh, and we can see it also in this conference uh, by the composition of uh, the audience uh, and some of the panels. Uh, and I'm worried by the fact that, uh, for example, uh, uh, some of our panelists couldn't be here due, due to various reasons uh, uh, and that uh, uh, we were not able to support them in coming uh, in person to this conference. Uh, so I want to conclude with this um, and uh, leave the floor to uh, Queen. Uh, thank you very much. So our next panelist, Quinn Dombrowski, will present on Sucho. And um, there is actually probably more than one elephant in the room. And so I just wanted to say that we have come up with a way of, um, like a surprise, I guess, of how we can figure out to give uh, Melissa's presentation that will follow right after. But now I'll give it over to Quinn, and you will hear the rest from Quinn. Hi, I'm Quinn Dombrowski. Um, in case you were wondering what I was up to up here, uh, continuing in the spirit of last night's keynote, I was revolving, um, using, using my portable spinning wheel to make yarn, uh, turning fluff in, into uh, singles of yarn that you then spin the other way around to get yarn that you can use for things. Um, until, of course, the rubber band broke. Um, you know, even revolution depends on infrastructure, and when the rubber band breaks, uh, the revolution comes to a screeching halt. So, uh, food for thought right there, I guess. Um, all right, so, so what I'm here to talk about today um, on my role on this panel is Sucho, Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, um, which started um, a few days after the uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia um, in you know, last, last March. And, um, you know, I... I myself had never really been involved in activist DH before. There's been several other projects in the past, you know, including um, Torn Apart Separados, um, Alex Hill, Rubik Arism, and, and several others, um, the Nimble Tens project. I always had some excuse to not get involved um, until this came along. And um, I mean, literally my, my background is in Slavic linguistics. And while I had never done anything involving web archiving before, it, it was one of those moments where, um, you know, 
know, you, you sort of feel the urgency of doing what you can. And um, I, I had lots of plans for the year. I was, I was going to build Corpora. I was working on the Data Sitters Club. Um, I had a, a full year of exciting DH planned that um, I had to put aside to go do something that was urgent. Um, so, you know, a couple days after the invasion, um, Anna Kias tweeted about doing a data rescue effort as part of a music library association meeting. Um, Sebastian Maestorovich saw this, I saw this. Um, we all got together, we started using the web recorder tools, um, and, and Ilya Kramer is, is here at the conference too. Um, fabulous, fabulous open source uh, web archiving tools. Um, and we just you know, got a bunch of people together and started archiving Ukrainian cultural heritage websites, defining cultural heritage very broadly. Um, not just libraries, archives, and museums, but one of the benefits of bringing together so many people is that you have lots of different perspectives on cultural heritage. Um, and for me, this also meant like hunting down fanfic sites. This meant looking at uh, you know, children's after school programs, uh, you know, dance schools with photos um, of, of you know, kids' recitals and, and things like that. Um, you know, we, we brought together over 1,500 people um, with lots of ages and experience. Um, like I said, I, I had never done web archiving before, so you know we all taught ourselves and wrote down how we learned it, and then taught other people often later that same day. Um, the problem we discovered, though, was that you know less than one percent of the cultural heritage of the country had been digitized. Um, we we were in touch with some folks on the ground, but our, our our vision here was that you know the the Ukrainian cultural heritage workers are busy protecting the physical objects that only they can protect, um, whereas us from around the world can archive websites. Um, and we we did you know I woke up one morning to a request uh, from a sysadmin saying that he saw that his site had been flagged as being offline on our giant spreadsheet, he had gotten it back up. Could we archive it quickly, please? Um, but, I mean, fundamentally, we were missing most of the cultural heritage because most of it had not been digitized in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we, we swore in the beginning we wanted to stay out of the physical world, like the physical world is messy, it involves, you know, borders, um, you know, tariffs, fees, shipping, um, all those sorts of problems, and we wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but as the project went on, we realized that, like, you know, if we wanted to not be like the the tech bros with their fantasy of like the one technology that's going to save the world, and there were many of them who showed up, um, you know, in uh, these spaces uh, during the war, um, you know, every 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 person who has had fantasies of like 3D modeling everything with phones, like, was there with like they they, they were going to solve all the problems um, with their one technology, and we didn't want to be the like you know web archiving version of like the one technology. Um, so, you know, we faced the fact that, like, to, to do what we actually want to do, um, which, which was not web archiving, it was, you know, trying to protect, uh, you know, this data and Ukrainian cultural heritage, we needed to start getting scanners to people. Um, and that's what we've been doing lately. Um, there's a much smaller um, but very committed group of people um, helping with this very complex project of getting digitization equipment to Ukraine, but also training people in how to use it, trying to help them form a network. Uh, there's now a project called Memory Savers that um, we've, we've gotten funding to put young people in museums, um, you know, many of, of which are run by, by older people, less digitally savvy people, um, to help them with the scanners, but also, um, you know, digital storytelling online. Um, and and this, this work takes a huge amount of non-automatable labor. Of course, like the, the AI folks also showed up. They're like, can AI help with this? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> like, just no. Um, <laughs> Not, I, I would say nice idea, but not even just just no. Um, so this this is this is just part of what we're doing now, um, and we are also very firm in the fact that um, you know I, I, it's, it's strange running this project but not having put two and two together until until someone brought this up as if I had thought of it. Um, you know we are fundamentally just data sitting. This is not our data. We don't want to create a giant archive of this material for people to study safely in the West while Ukraine burns. Um, we're just holding on to it for a period of time until we give it back. Digital repatriation is, is at the heart of, of what we're doing. Um, so anyhow, uh, there is something you can do too. You can go to this URL right here um, and vote for us um, as part of the uh, Europa Nostra uh, Community Choice Award, um, where they will give us money that we can use to buy scanners to send to Ukraine. Um, so 
easy peasy. There's, there'll also be a QR code on our poster this evening. Um, so yes, please vote for us and, and any arbitrary building or other thing you would like to vote for. You have to vote for like three things and there's a lot of buildings you can choose from. Um, so yes, that, that is what I have in my Sucho hat. So thank you. And this is Ellie. Um, <laughs> Ellie uh, would like to channel Melissa Terrace, who cannot be here this morning. Um, I, I didn't want to be up here doing more talking, uh, you know. I like so. So we thought we thought maybe Ellie could could help out. Um, is there a slide? We've got a slide. All right. Uh, yeah, Ellie, uh, for, for what it's worth, is the beloved stuffed animal of my five-year-old, given to me in the last few moments before I left for this trip. Um, you know, she, she uh, parted from Eliza um, with Eliza's desire that she um, come with me to see the world. So now she gets to give a conference talk. <laughs> this is what happens when you go with a, a parent to go see the world. You get roped into these things. <laughs> All right. A quote from a paper by Fabazi Etar, PhD student in the iSchool at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, from her 2018 paper, Vocational Awe and Librarianship, The Lies We Tell Ourselves, in Library with a Lead Pipe, an OA library journal. Vocational awe describes a set of ideas, values, and assumptions librarians have about themselves and the profession that result in notions that libraries as institutions are inherently good, sacred notions, and therefore beyond critique. Etar argues that the concept of vocational awe directly correlates to problems within librarianship like burnout and low salary. Her article aims to describe the phenomenon and its effects on library philosophies and practices so that they may be recognized and deconstructed, including issues such as burnout, undercompensation, job creep, lack of diversity, and murderdom. What would this look like when we switched library with digital humanities? Vocational awe describes a set of ideas, values, and assumptions digital humanists have about themselves and the profession that result in the notion that digital humanities as a subject area is inherently good, sacred notions, and therefore beyond critique. So vocational awe in DH, we see arguments about access and digital online, um, you know, how that inherently increases access. Um, it, is it really? Um, in terms of diversity, we make claims on that front, but DH is pretty ossified. 20% of professors in the EU are women, etc. Very few people of color, and DH is no different. Um, and then there's the rhetoric we have around responding to the digital churn in society. Are we really, and does another edition uh, really help anyone? We need to fight against using rhetoric about DH brilliance and a return to critique. I have always believed in using critique as a positive force in my work, a driver. I would like to call for more honesty about the situatedness of DH, mostly white, mostly rich, recreating the academic institutions it built itself from and not being self-aware enough to critique that. DH needs a little more self-awareness and a little more action. I would like to call for a little less DH awe. So, Melissa Terra says channel through Ellie. Thank you. So thank you, Mike is working. So thank you very much again to Quinn for stepping up for Melissa and especially to Ellie for stepping up and having this great experience of talking to a crowd of digital human humans. So I think we're ready for some questions now and I think we got a, a, a great variety of uh, tasks and things to do and I'm sure there's going to be questions about that. I'll, I'll take my prerogative of having two hats uh, to, to respond to uh, Melissa slash Ellie's, uh, you know, prompt about critique. Um, at, at least sort of in, in my own approach to DH, I, I find that um, kind of another angle on critique that, that might be generative is um, the idea of taking fun seriously. Um, you know, we can, we can be serious about our, our work, but we can also embrace the fact that like what we do is fun and we can implement kind of these, these critiques in, in fun ways ways, uh, be it through making things, be it through, uh, you know, kind of embracing, uh, you know, bringing a stuffed elephant uh, to a talk, um, or, or kind of reimagining um, our work in, in different ways. So, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that can be a useful angle on it. Okay, I think there's a question here in front. Hi, I'm Barbara Borgren, for those who do not know me. Um, and I, I think it's great uh, to, to have a critical position, but it's also easy to have a critical position sitting in a position of power. 
And I wonder what is it the practical thing that someone in a position of power can do to change things? Because ultimately it's not coming to the conference and saying, yeah, this is really bad and we shouldn't do it. But what is being done? That's my question. And what do you say to others that would like to do something? What should they do? I'm not in a position of power, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> no, I, um, I think, uh, well, when it comes to projects, uh, I think that hiring practices are very important. Uh, when it comes to conferences, I think that uh, there should be support for people who want to come, uh, but don't have the means. Uh, and I, I think that especially for uh, uh, in-person conferences, this is quite lacking at the moment in digital humanities conferences. Uh, there are high costs uh, and uh, it is difficult to reach the destinations which are often times uh, in Europe or North America. Um, so, uh, when it comes to practical things, I think uh, there should be more investment in this, and not just uh, um, and when it comes to uh, projects, uh, also that now I'm my background is more technical, so. I don't have the expertise to answer about uh, participatory practices, but as I said, I think that any project right now uh, that uh, handles uh, uh, data, uh, for example, from cultural institutions uh, and does not adopt a participatory practice uh, that looks outside of the institution itself uh, is uh, uh, in some way incomplete, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm also not in a position of power, <laughs> at least in the context of my university. Um, I am staff, I am not even academic staff, I am the same broad classification of staff as the folks who work in the cafeteria. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think in terms of things that people in positions of institutional power have done that have been useful and practical, um, part of it is just not like getting out of the way, not throwing up barriers, um, you know, and and saying yes when there's a situation that needs saying yes to, and uh, kind of making problems disappear. Uh, working on Sucho, um, you know, there were several months where it was it was all I did. Um, I, I actually, you know. I have a job with regular responsibilities, but both my department and the head of the library, um, you know, explicitly said to me, you know, there's nothing we can ask you to do that's more important than this. Go do it. Um, and even now, they're they're very supportive of the fact that like this is part of what I do, and they they embrace and celebrate that, and and don't mind when you know I don't show up, uh, you know, as early as expected because I'm on you know conference calls at 6 a.m. Um, yeah, so I I think you know. There, there are things that people in positions of power can do, but kind of empowering other people and supporting them kind of within their organization to like go do good things, um, I, I think has a, a major impact. Uh, I'm not a panelist, but um, we didn't mention this, but um, the two of us are in the um, German The H Association's um, working group that's cheesily called empowerment for various reasons, but maybe it's interesting because we would have called it diversity, but we're not diverse. So we're both not in positions of power, but we are in a position of privilege, and we are also experiencing the problem that we're trying to do good things, but we still can't get out of our own skins in a way. So this has been a challenge we were trying to address also with um, convening a panel like this, because ultimately, we're trying, but at the same time, it's, um, it's not self-evident how to address it. So that was a really great question. I thought maybe we can talk about it more in the future. I think we should talk about it now. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, then let's go. So maybe if I may add to that, we all kind of stated that we are not in positions of power, but on the other hand, I mean, we are a community, we are a room full of digital humanists right now, and so each and every one of us could consider what we could actually do um, to, to improve and get more people involved, um, build some networks, include people actively, um, that's what we're trying, maybe failing a bit today, <laughs> since not all of us are here. But yeah, I think the power of the community should not be uh, yeah, forgotten. Who is a tenured faculty member in the room? There's a few of you. <laughs> ten, ten, tenured, tenured people with tenured faculty hats. Do, do you have? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, great. That, Let's pass the talking block and see if you have any ideas for what you can do with that power. Um, I was just, thank you for this panel, and I'm Allison Booth from the University of Virginia, and it, something just, I didn't think came up so far, and I'm sorry I, I came in late, but uh, it seems to me to increase a borderless worldwide that includes community and collaboration ground up, you need to, uh, I was just seeing on tweet, Twitter the banning of books, the assaults on primary education in the United States, wouldn't we want to be talking about early education and using digital tools? So I just want to hear more of what you all think about educating before people are in graduate school, before they're doing their dissertation. So this is not addressing directly the staff status. On the other hand, I think it is, because I think if, every, if, if all of our colleagues have grown up learning something about the digital, they won't have contempt for it. They won't regard it as mere hands-on. And I do know what the contempt is like, even at the university of Okay, did you want to comment directly on the question or? No, no. okay, so is, is that um, question finished? Neither. So I think one problem is funding because you won't get equal funding for every primary school and neither even earlier. So there is a huge problem of um, the distribution of money to everyone. And that's also a thing that I um, recognized yesterday when we saw the slide with where do the contributions to this conference come from? And I saw no contribution from the South Americas. And I thought, no, this is impossible because there's so much going on in Brazil and overall um, there is much DH um, um, research going on over there. So I thought about what can we do as the ad hoc community? How can we support those people? And I really liked the idea of localized DH because we have all those different parts of the ad hoc community overall on the world. And I would like to know, okay, what could we do as participants of these um, localized DH communities to support the, the communities on all over the world and also maybe to, to show the diversity of our community that is not only focused on the Northern Americas and um, Europe. Thank you. <laughs> there is a mailing list, I can post it in the app. Um, sorry. Oh, I dropped a bit of it. Jeez. Sorry. So there is, we have a mailing list and membership is just by, by joining the mailing list. 
and you can discuss reached there about uh, 764 members. Actually, Quinn was one of the members of our executive for a while and uh, did a lot of uh, work for us uh, in GoDH. But uh, that's one way of, uh, of reaching uh, to a wider community. And of course, there are loads of uh, colleagues in Africa, in Asia, in uh, you know, uh, you know, parts of the Mediterranean that you might want to meet too. And some of them hang out there. So join us. It's free. <laughs> <Like this. laughs> okay. There is one. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for pointing that out. And another idea that I had was um, something like a, like a um, exposition of the local DH communities, maybe in a room, um, so that we have some space for this, di for this diversity that we have in the ad hoc community. So that we have, for example, one exposition with a one hour and a half slot where the DH communities, the local ones, can present themselves and show and then connect with each other as well. And maybe also find ideas how to fund through corporations because there often are fun funding opportunities uh, for corporations, for beginning corporations with other universities. And maybe doing this, there would be some opportunities for um, for DH communities with lower budget to then um, actually join the conferences and um, be part of it. Oh, wait, no, uh, Dinara has a other talking. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, this is in response to this. Uh, uh, though I, I teach at the university now, I, I've actually taught K through 12, basically kindergartners through 12th graders. And one of the things that we're trying to do in our projects are incorporate uh, teachers. Um, these projects can be very intimidating for uh, a lot of people. Um, a, lot, uh, and a, a, a lot of big words. Uh, <laughs> and if you're trying to teach younger kids, uh, like even though I, I, I have a teaching credential in the United States, in California specifically, um, I've never taught a fourth grade class and I don't always know the language to use to help interpret that. And so I think one of the things that we could do to help open this up uh, and, and start it earlier is to bring in those teachers who have experience on the ground, who know how to communicate better uh, with younger audiences. Because, I, and it's not, I mean, we just don't have the experience. And so I think um, the communication aspect of it uh, can be really important um, so that, you know, we're not, we're not alienating uh, younger uh, potential users of our of our projects. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think uh, continue or, or maybe you know, to respond to your uh, comments. I want to say something about uh, Central Asia, uh, where I have lived last almost ten months months, and uh, I tried. Still, I'm trying to do something for digital humanities in Central Asia. Uh, it's very interesting region. This amazing cultural heritage uh, and this region was uh, is very old history, uh, 20th century, and uh, last uh, decades also not so easy, and it's very poor countries. Uh, there, uh, there were five countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Uh, three of them uh, are now like open for tourists, for money from abroad and so on. Uh, but what we see, uh, according to this region, uh, cultural heritage of this region was hidden, kind of hidden, uh, through Soviet times. Uh, now they try to, it is not digitized now because of financial things and others, not only financial, but also infrastructural things. And uh, when we ask something uh, about this region's ChatGPT or other such technologies, they know nothing because it's not digitized, it's not 
seen to, not only to society, but also to technologies. And uh, what we can do now, I don't know, we can bring some, uh, seeing some standards from Europe or North America to these countries and say that, okay, we can do, uh, if you want to be seen by society, by world, by technologies, you have to do this and this, but again, kind of colonism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel my, myself very uncomfortable these 10 months when I came to universities to professors, uh, they are excellent professors and they, de they do uh, their digital researchers in history or linguistics, but they, they are not like a part of uh, international community and they can't uh, go here because it's very expensive. It's, uh, I don't know, 300 euros, it's so huge money for these regions. And what, what we can do uh, for these regions, like Central Asia is most interesting for me because <laughs> I'm affiliated now with Central Asia. But again, I'm affiliated with American University of Central Asia. It's again like, kind of colon, <laughs> colonialism <laughs> uh, and it, it's not uh, this region is not very interesting from international infrastructures like the area for example okay we understand the areas for Europe but uh, maybe you have any ideas what you can do yeah I mean I think again like colonial yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Because on, on one hand, um, you don't want to be like, here, here are the standards I am bringing you, like, from Europe, like, please appreciate them and implement them in the proper way. Like, no one, no one, like, that's a terrible approach. Um, it, I mean, it's also not practical in a lot of cases. Um, and and this, this has been a struggle that we've had when, when working uh, with the Ukrainian libraries, too, because there's, like, the ideal universe way that you could go about digitizing these things, and then there's the practical reality of, like, you have maybe three hours of power a day. Um, <laughs> so, and also people need to like charge their phones and like maybe running the scanner is not the highest priority. Like what can you get done in a meaningful, in a meaningful way? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think realistically, be it like looking at the like case of South America or be it, you know, looking at the case of, of Central Asia, um, you know, the, the idea of a, an international in-person conference where we're all going to like show up and meet like isn't, isn't going to happen. Um, you know, and, and the last three years have been interesting that way in terms of, you know, none of us have had a chance to meet. And we've, you know, th there's been ways that the groups of people have managed to connect over that period of time. Um, a lot of them are really unsatisfying, though. Um, so, I mean, I, I sort of love some of the, you know, lightweight but practical community building you guys are doing with uh, DH Cloud. Um, you know, like the, the idea of there being sort of like a, a kind of link linguistically, um, you know, common, uh, you know, WhatsApp groups or Telegram groups or things like that. I mean, I think our, our way to kind of bring people into a community that you can then sort of look for opportunities for them to connect with the larger, the larger piece. Um, I mean, I, I also am, am I, I still think about what are some meaningful ways that people can connect virtually um, beyond just Zoom. I mean, I think Zoom works for certain things, like it doesn't work very well for um, kind of meeting people and, and getting talking about stuff and getting excited about projects and having ideas. Um, I, yeah, and I, I, think, I think there's enough creativity in this community that we can do better, and I, I hope we do. Thank you for the careful delivery. <laughs> I'm sad I didn't get to catch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Quinn, hearing you talk about um, the experience with Sucho of having people kind of show up and, and try to offer a single technology as like a, a lightning bolt solution um, made me wonder for you and for all of the, the panelists maybe um, how you deal with uh, it, maybe well-intentioned people who are in positions of power but who are slightly misguided um, 
how you, I guess, what, what practices you have for either redirecting that energy or just minimizing the amount of time that you have to spend dealing with them at all? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that this, this is one of those things where the, the experience of you know, spending my whole career in staff positions really helps. Um, because, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm used to sort of interacting with people with power, like from a position where I don't and like, you know, I, I, could, I could potentially find myself in deep trouble if I you know, like upset them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just like being very friendly and polite, you know, and like wishing them good luck with it and, you know, maybe, maybe even playing up our own ignorance about the situation, you know, uh, downplaying the connections that we may have, um, certainly not passing along all the contact info that we possibly could. Um, I mean, with, with a lot of these projects, it's, it's clear that they will fizzle out by themselves. Um, so yeah, kind of, and there's, the, I mean, there are, there are misguided projects that we've been able to like slightly redirect somewhat, but I mean, especially with the like, you know, messianic technology folks, um, you know, you sort of wish them good luck and send them on their way uh, politely uh, so they feel good about the interaction um, and uh, you can get back to work. <laughs> Can you hear me? All right. If there are no urgent questions right now, I would like to present an answer from Padmini to a previous question, if that is all right. So she responds to Barbara's questions about how people in power can help those of us who are relatively disadvantaged. I will read now. It's a quite lengthy answer. And please proactively make the effort to listen and learn about our context. While, for example, the work that Quinn and her team is doing is exemplary and fantastic, I have on various occasions had to reach out to international colleagues to offer us safe harbors for material arising from protests and similar in an increasingly, oh, similar, <laughs> I'm sorry. In an increasingly connected world, there's no excuse to not reach out to colleagues elsewhere whose countries might be encountering upheavals of various sorts to ask, volunteer and facilitate what you can do to help. The very format of this conference itself has silenced in a very real sense the participation of global participants by not offering infrastructural support for those of us who can't attend due to a range of exigencies and there needs to be more thoughtfulness as well as asking what is needed rather than making assumptions that are often based on a knowledge of those in relative positions of power and privilege. Thank you. It's not a direct response, it's just like an observation I made um, because uh, going back to the um, theme of self critique and mediation, like uh, looking at what you can do for marginalized um, person groups. And one thing I noticed is like everyone's wearing a bad some people have problems with it, and some people have don't. And I think it's a very interesting decision by the organizers. Probably not intention that way, but it's kind of weird because um, you don't even have to put in problems. So like now you walk around and like see some people with you like, hey, it's cool, and you see some people without them, and you're like, hey, it's a political statement. Or is it just say, did they just forget to put it in because it wasn't necessary for the registration? And in my opinion, like putting like using pronouns like or in the introduction or on the band that either works if everyone's doing it or nobody's doing it because it creates an economy where it's like, yeah, it's still like an ring for both sides because like the people with problems like, okay, I'm the one with them and it's like, yeah, okay, are you have problems or are you normal without problems? Like, um, I kind of think a bit weird and like, just for like future events, like, yeah, either make it necessary to put them in or don't at all, but like this, in between stuff, it's like no, it has no one. It's like intended probably as like inclusionary, but it's in my opinion really the opposite. Yeah, I actually hate being asked about pronouns. <laughs> uh, I mean, I identify as non-binary in English. Um, I don't really any pronouns are fine and, and sort of being put in a position where I feel like I have to like pick something or like claim some as mine when like I really truly don't care any of them are fine um, I, I find I find sort of awkward but um, yeah it's 
I, I, I think where norms are evolving on this um, is, is still in flux. Um, so, you know, we'll see where it ends up. Um, I've been to several conferences where the option is not there. I think uh, it's, uh, it's good to have the option at least. I, uh, otherwise, I usually write uh, the pronouns on the badge myself, but um, yeah, that's uh, that's something that I mean, it's easy to do for a conference. It's not difficult to do, uh, but many conferences don't care enough. Um. Related, and this is actually a, a battle that I have gotten into, um, is the titles, um, where the only option for a gender-neutral title is if you have a PhD. Uh, which is kind of funny. Um, so yeah, the, and, and, and thankfully, like Adho has listened, and this is this is where the like no title slash none, and and now now I get emails like dear colleague Quinn Dombrowski, and I, I like the sound of that. I'm cool with colleague. Um, I don't know. I have the box now. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I wasn't quite uh, sure when to start. So. Uh, sorry, I have the box, um, and I was first. Sorry. Oh, you have box. So maybe I just say something first. Okay. Um, sorry if it will maybe come a bit incoherent because I'm also feeling a bit not so well this morning. That's why I was at the back, but. Um, I have uh, several questions um, because these discussions um, always uh, make me think a lot. Um, also for uh, disclosure, I'm an almost tenured person um, at the moment and I have, I think, always worked from more like a privileged um, position. But um, the work of those, um, like the group empowerment or also these panels um, I'm attending, um, it gives me um, more and more thinking, what can we really do? And Daniela, um, I really like this mapping exercise um, from the um, data perspective because it was very structured and um, also for those big questions we have raised now um, because it's one thing to come with a, like a personal statement, um, which is really good, but I do think um, the more we discuss very intensely those topics, we will have to come to a kind of mapping exercise to see exactly what, where do we struggle and which border um, we have to cross. And some of the points you were making were even making me think because we had this discussion um, and saying like, you know, the DH bubble, it is so nice and like everybody is very happy. Um, but I do think a lot of the problems are like, they are beyond the digital humanities. Uh, the, the border we have to cross are beyond DH. Um, our academia, our the situation of the world in a whole, it's about solidarity um, and if some regions of the world are not present, if some disciplines are not present, it has a lot to do um, with global structures that are beyond even academia. So, but what can we do on the academia? Um, open access to resources, but also um, I, I, I was so inspired by, um, you know, what's a low-tech DH, um, because like the people come with million dollars, euro projects, um, um, but it's not available to everyone and it, it doesn't even appeal to everyone. But if this is what we count um, and what leads to tenure and what leads you to a, a, a conference like this, um, we are shutting uh, doors where we shouldn't. Um, and that's all I want to uh, say, and it's really good um, that we are here and I can discuss this openly. Um, thank you. Can I say, um, I think that it is true that many of these issues are structural uh, and outside of the age itself, but I think also the age as a sector as a big problem with diversity, uh, and we see it uh, compared to other 
uh, sectors of academia. Uh, I also think that uh, it can become an excuse uh, to say that uh, the problem is structural and we can't do anything about it. Uh, so that, that is a big risk if we see it that way. Uh, in my work, uh, I work with data and data models. Uh, uh, I, I can't do much uh, on, uh, other, uh, on other issues, but I can do something to improve uh, uh, modeling practices, which are very often, uh, um, let's say, not good <laughs> because they uh, they, the data models themselves are biased because they are uh, uh, created by small groups of people uh, who uh, are very white uh, Western uh, people usually. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is something that, uh, uh, that I'm working on, uh, the modeling. But, uh, I think everyone can do something. I'm, uh, I think it, we sh shouldn't be self-defeating and say uh, it's, it's just outside of the reach of, uh, of the age. Also, crowdsourced projects such as uh, uh, Queen's project, for example, are very good examples of something that can be done uh, uh, not from the top, but uh, just by uh, getting a group of people together uh, online, and uh, uh, and it can achieve a lot, uh, you know. So. Okay, I think what happens is that we are almost in the coffee break, but uh, I know there's at least one more question. So maybe if you could keep it brief, we can. No, you bring back. Okay. So there's. Um, yeah, okay, so we have like two more questions there, and if you could keep it very brief, and maybe brief answers as well. Is that me now? You can't yeah. see behind me. Uh, sorry, it's fine, I'm money. Uh, apologies early, and I will keep it very, very quick, very, very brief. Um, I am very privileged, I know I'm very privileged. In my young, my youth, I was not privileged. I know the difference, right? In my youth, middle ages, I had nothing at all. Now I'm very privileged. I'm also an old white guy. Right? which gives me another angle as well. But borderlands, silos, a lot of what I talk about now and write about is like diversity, inclusion, equality, these sorts of things. I'm sitting here listening to different voices, different accents, everybody speaking in English. That is a huge issue for exclusion. Exactly the fellow from India was saying. Um, the, the fact that we have these conflicts in English I don't know any solution to these, but I've been working with colleagues in China since 2015. Um, I retired from UCL a few years ago, and I'm working full-time in China now. So I have in the face. I can't speak Chinese. I get it, exactly. Um, <clears throat> they have their uh, National Association of Human Humanities. Uh, my paper was the only non-Chinese paper that went in there. Nobody else put one in. We spoke in English. Um, this year, they're only accepting Chinese ones. Hey, why bother? Uh, but it's also extremely diff difficult for them to get either papers in new conferences or publications in our major PH um, journals. It is hugely problematic, uh, and the pressure for publication in those Faraday SSCI journals that they face as well. Um, but it seems more recently that ADO seems to be going towards associations based on, on language, the Francophone, the, the German-speaking one, the Red from Mexico, these, these sort of ones. Is this the way to go, a more decentralized approach? So there's, there's a lot of issues there, um, and I'm, I'm happy to share, if you haven't heard the news, that uh, ADHO has recently accepted a multilingual DH special interest group um, that's interested in, in talking about and trying to, to grapple with a lot of this. Till, right there, thank you for raising your hand, uh, is one of the coordinators of the multilingual DH working group. Um, so talk to him during the coffee break, I would suggest. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, so thanks a lot for your questions and thanks for being here. Maybe we can still um, continue chatting over a coffee break, uh, but we also don't want to keep you from it. Thanks for showing up for these issues and uh, contact us if you want to keep collaborating on this. Everybody's welcome. You can join our working group and yeah, have a nice conference. <laughs>